Right. Uh, good evening. Um, as mentioned, uh, my name's Mark Jones. I'm a farm consultant uh, based near Welsh Bullion with Wales. Um, I've been working with beef and sheep farmers now for about 15 years, uh, generally uh, working with farmers on business advice, grassland and forage, and then um, just looking at trying to get more performance, uh, whether that's from suckler herds, calf to beef or, or sheep systems. Uh, I also, um, at home, uh, we're taking about 350 mostly Angus and Hereford calves each year to rear in the autumn. I will take these uh, all the way through to finish um, at about 20 to 24 months of age. So I've got a good practical um, aspect to it as well. Really. So I've, I've seen it from both the research side um, and also the practical side. So we're just looking at um, calf to beef systems tonight and um, I'm just gonna concentrate on some of the key aspects for success. Uh, although it's, I'm skipping through it fairly quickly, um, you know, you could go into a, you could make a, a talk on each of the individual subjects, to be honest. So uh, feel free to ask uh, questions at the end. So points to cover to start with, uh, why dairy beef? So why should you choose that over structural cow production or, or sheep or even dairy? Um, it's also very important to find the right system for your farm to make it fit in. Uh, we'll look at the sourcing, rearing and weaning of the calves. Um, this is probably the most important aspect of uh, the whole job. If you get this wrong, um, you're really going to, to struggle to get or make money um, out of the system in the future. Uh, transition to grass. Uh, so I suppose for this talk and because we live in Wales, I've really concentrated on um, more grassland systems and forage systems. Um, as a whole, so the grassland side of it and that transition to grass is, is very important from, uh, from that calf point of view. Winter feeding, so whether that's outwintering or feeding the cattle on silage or finishing intensively, uh, I'll just flick over that quickly. And then I suppose the, the end product really, uh, finishing at grass or looking to house to finish depending on your farming system. So uh, we'll look at that. And then finally, uh, the targets and returns. So what you need to, to hit your performance figures and to obtain those returns really. Um, but what you'll find with dairy beef is that um, you've got to be pretty hot on, on all the subjects. Um, and if you fail at one, um, you can quickly spiral um, badly out of control. Right, so to start with, why dairy beef? So I suppose looking at where we are at the moment um, and looking at the farm business survey data, the average beef and sheep farm actually loses money without the single farm payment. So I think the average farm, uh, single farm payment's about £20,000 and that is really the profit of the farm. So it's, it's break even without that, if that makes sense. So it's important going forward if the single farm payment is due to change or, or disappear. Uh, that would try and obtain uh, a profit without those single farm payments. Um, the average sucker cow at the moment is losing £93 per head, um, and that is just up to weaning. Uh, quite often, when we include finishing as well, uh, the sucker cow is losing probably near £300 a head. So um, we're just looking at a different system to see if we can improve that profitability. Of course, um, it can be simply we don't need to calve, calve the cows, and don't need to be up through the middle of the night. However, uh, the calf rearing stage is quite intensive uh, and you will be busy for, for a couple of months during that period. Um, higher stocking rate, so really instead of a cow and a calf, uh, you can keep sort of two to three calves. So really what you're doing is increasing your stocking rate and hopefully increasing your profitability per hectare. Uh, so that's very much linked um, all together. So as you can imagine, you suck the cow, you've got to keep that for a, for a whole year um, just to get one calf out of it, while you could be keeping another couple of calves and increasing that output from that cow. And then finally, um, just utilising the increase in uh, beef calves going forward from the dairy herd. So a lot of herds now are starting to use sex semen, so there's a reduction, uh, particularly in the black and white bull calves, um, 
and there'll be more beef side cows around going forward. So this potentially could lead to an increase in beef supply from the dairy herd. And if the suckler herd reduces, it could be the, the main source of, of beef. Right, so finding the right system for your farm, uh, what do we need to think about? Well, um, I thought I'd just start with uh, when the calves are born to start with, uh, just to give you a quick idea of the, the different systems. Uh, so firstly, we've got all year round calving and finishing. So to start with, it's um, going to give you a good cash flow, which uh, when you come to finishing, you'll be having uh, cattle going away um, all through the year. Um, you'll also have to buy the calves in little batches of going through the year. Um, and then, um, because we've got these smaller batches all the way through the year, uh, they're a lot easier to handle. Uh, but I suppose the downside to it is that you're calf rearing all the way through the year. So you could be on twice a day feeding uh, throughout, so it can be quite a time. Um, it'd also be more complex and harder to manage your grass because you could have three or four different uh, groups of cattle. Well, if you were batch, you were getting calves which were born over in the autumn or the spring, um, you could keep them all in, in one group. So autumn born calves. Uh, so the slight disadvantage of this is that uh, you'll have a large amount of cash. Because as you can imagine, there's a full two years before you get your returns. Um, and then once you're into the system, you'll have a huge amount of money coming in uh, next summer in the autumn, but then you won't have any money for the, for the rest of the year. So uh, it's about managing your cash flow. Um, at this time of the year, the calves are a, a lot cheaper to buy because that's when um, you have a lot of autumn calving herds. Um, as I mentioned, you can have large batches of calves to rear because they're all coming in in one hit. So I suppose uh, you may need extra help during that period, but again, um, you could just specialize and, and do a better job in, in that shorter period of time. They're generally easier to manage your grass because you've just got, uh, well, you'll have two groups of, of cattle, one uh, under 12 months of age, and then you finish your cattle over 12 months of age, um, which will make the system a lot easier. We've then got uh, your spring-born calves. So again, uh, similar kind of system. Uh, you'll need quite a bit of cash uh, to run it again, but again, you'll have some uh, cheaper calves to buy at that point as, as there's an excess of, of calves. You'll be able to buy uh, large batches of calves again to rear, so you'll have a very busy period. Uh, but again, it's easier to manage your grass and also um, to finish up grass. I think the one issue we've got with springborn calves uh, we've got to think about is that uh, we'll probably have to house them to finish them for their in their second winter, if that makes sense. But with the autumn-born calves, you've done the calf rearing bit as uh, small calves, they've come in then as weanlings, um, and then they're finishing up class, so you don't need as much silage and concentrates to finish on the system. The advantage of the spring-born calves is that you can calf rear um, quite a lot outside uh, once the weather warms up, so that's, that's a big advantage. The final thing we need to be wary of with the spring-born spring calves is um, you know what cows have they come out of as well. They could be out of Jersey and you might have a few small Jersey crosses there so if you're buying heifers you may not be able to get them up to supermarket uh, finishing spec which is about 260 to 270 kilos dead weight so that's something to bear in mind. Generally the steers you'll get up to that weight but it may take a little bit longer to get there. Right, and then just moving on to some of the, the different systems we're, we're looking at. So I suppose you could go out initially and purchase calves, uh, do all the calf rearing yourself, or there's a lot of firms out there which, such as like Butelar, uh, Meadow Quality, Select Livestock, you can actually go out and, and buy weanlings off these firms at about 150 kilos. You can bring them in for anything from 350 to 450 pounds, um, and then it just simplifies um, your system, you can then turn them straight out to grass with a little bit of feed to transition them, and the system is very nice and simple. We've also got to be looking at what we're aiming to do with uh, the cattle at the end of the day. Are we looking to do store cattle production or are we looking at finishing cattle? So, obviously, TB can be an issue in certain areas. Um, if we're finishing cattle, there's a lot less risk because they can go away anyway. Um, but with store cattle, if we fail a TB test, we could be stuck with them and we may need to send them to a TB unit at a cheaper price 
we may have to try and finish those um, intensively. Uh, generally, with the store cattle, uh, we'd be aiming to sell them at 18 months. Um, that's generally the, the spec that's required. So we're aiming for them to be over 400 kilos to go to a finishing unit. There's a funny age between 200 and 400 kilos where the cattle don't seem to sell quite as well. So that may not uh, work into the system. The store cattle system is probably the most profitable one if you can get it to work because the cattle are a lot smaller, so your stocking rates are a lot higher. And then we've got to look at uh, the breeds. So uh, we've got the you know, natives and continentals generally. Uh, also, we've got the black and white bull calves if you want to use those as uh, bulls for finishing um, or, or can use them as steers. So with the continentals, we're usually paying uh, a lot more for them. And then we're aiming, I suppose, to get maybe one grade higher. So maybe an R grade rather than O plus grade at the abattoir. The natives, uh, we have premiums, so the Angus, um, we can almost get £100 a head more for finishing it. Uh, so again, when we're looking at these systems and our costs, um, it's good just to go over the price of the calves and the finishing element to see where you won't be. And again, uh, in terms of growth rates, um, they're going to be fairly similar, just the natives will finish a little bit easier off grass than the continentals, which will probably need a little bit of grain or corn. Um, just a few other things to be wary of with the abattoirs, so the number of moves, if you're over four farms, um, you can have a reduction in uh, your pence per kilo payments. Also, uh, there's age for premium and weight spec, so by that, sometimes if you're over 24 months of age, you can have 10 pence knocked off, and then once you get over 28 to 30 months, you could be out of spec completely for some of the supermarket contracts. And this applies to the different weight specs as well. So quite often they want them as an, at a minimum of 280 kilos. If you're under that, they'll take a few pence off. And again, if you're over 380 kilos, uh, quite often they'll, they'll do the same. So it's important you've done your homework before you, you get into these systems. Generally, confirmation is O plus and above, uh, with fat levels uh, three and four L. But again, there's quite a few companies will take leaner cattle at uh, twos, which is you know quite useful, um, especially in a dry season when you're trying to finish off grass uh, like this year. So looking at um, the sourcing um, of calves. So really, what we're we're wanting um, off that dairy farmer is uh, is for those calves to have colostrum really, so they're nice, fit, and healthy and their immune systems are a lot stronger. So ideally we're wanting that dairy farmer to feed three liters within two hours of birth. And then uh, we're looking for another three liters, uh, six to 12 hours after birth. You know, so if we've got good farmer, dairy farmers who um, produce you know, good, strong quality heifers, hopefully they're doing that with their beef calves as well. We also want to be looking for weight for age when we're buying calves. So generally we're aiming at uh, purchasing calves at two to three weeks of age. At this age, they're usually over any scour issues. So um, that's a big help to you as a calf rarer. Uh, but by weight for age, we're aiming for about 50 kilos at two weeks of age. And then for the native cattle, which are born a little bit smaller, uh, we're aiming for about 45 kilos. So if some of those calves are sort of a month old and they're only 45 kilos. Uh, they've either had health issues or the farmer hasn't done them as well. So they're probably fully one to avoid. And then in terms of health status of uh, the herds you're buying off, it's quite useful to know if they're BVD testing or BVD free. They got an IBR issue. And again, uh, TB issues in the past as well. Um, although if you're buying off several farms, it's, it does get quite hard to, um, to stay away from some of these issues. And then most importantly, it's looking to see if the, the calves are healthy. So we're looking at um, no diet signs of diarrhea, and then no discharge from the mouth, nose, or ears. And then, of course, if they're skipping around the pens and they've got that nice shiny coat, um, hopefully they're, they're good to buy. Right, so then looking at the rearing of calves, um, and then I suppose it's really getting those basics correct. Um, it's really looking at this in a, a little bit more detail with, with your vets uh, before you get going. So really, it's really important to have a BBD policy. Uh, so whether the farmer you're buying off has 
already tag and tested. Um, you can obviously do that yourselves at the arrival farm. Uh, there's also a snap test where you'll take a notch from a, a calf's ear and you can then, um, if you get a BVD PI, you can pull that um, out and get to that calf as, as soon as possible. Any BVD uh, calves or PIs in the system, you'll find that you'll have a greater uh, death rate and pneumonia issues. It's important to have dedicated sheds for calf rearing. So by that, I mean, you don't want older animals within that shed or very close to it where the egg is actually shared. So they're immune to some of the pneumonia viruses and they'll just pass those over to the calves. So that's just something you've got to be aware of. And um, because of that reason, it's very important to try and have a, an all in, all out system. So we don't want to be mixing ages of calves. So ideally what we're aiming for is a 10 day period where all those calves are brought into that shed or that air system. Um, and then that's the end of it. Uh, we'll rear those calves um, up to weaning, they can move on, and then we can clean the shed out and then start again. But it's all to do uh, with trying to reduce um, any disease issues. So like I said, wash and disinfect the sheds um, as soon as the calves leave. And it's important to do the same with the feeding equipment as well. Right, so then um, moving over to um, milk powder. So really what we're aiming for um, is a milk powder with 20 to 26% uh, protein. Um, and then we're aiming for 18 to 20% oil. And uh, what I've got there in the table on the left hand side um, is a daily quantity of milk replacer supplied per calf for different mixing rates and the required litres to be fed per day. So just to give you an example, um, if we had a mixing rate of 150 grams a litre and we were aiming to give them four litres, uh, that would give us 600 grams per day. So ideally we'd feed that in two feeds of two litres, um, morning and night. Um, ideally what we're, what a lot of uh, farmers and um, prescriptions are, are to be trying to hit 750 uh, grams being fed in a day. So then we're, if we're at that 150 grams a litre, we'd be then up to five litres a day or two and a half litres in the morning and two and a half litres at night. So really we're aiming for a 0.7 to 0.8 kilos a day live weight gain while they're, while they're on their milk. Um, there are a lot of systems where they actually um, increase. So if you're on machines, quite often they're having up to a kilo of milk powder a day and the growth rates then are expected to be much larger. But also there are systems where they'll um, sort of reduce the amount of um, milk powder with the aim that the calves get onto feed a lot quicker um, and you can wean them a lot earlier as well from that point of view as, um, as basically they develop the rumens a lot quicker. So there's, there's different ways of doing it um, and again uh, once a day can be used quite effectively as well um, on these systems. So do your research, go to farms which are running the systems uh, and see what suits your farm best. It's very important um, also to have a starter feed, um, ad lib in the pens at all times, again with, with water. And what we're aiming for is you know, very high quality 12 ME uh, feeds with crude protein of around 18%. And really we're wanting quite high starch content to try and develop the rumen. So we're looking for barley based really uh, kind of meals. And uh, again, maize can be used within that mix as well. Straw is also very crucial. Uh, so it's there to provide some scratch factor and again, develop that rumen so we can get those calves weaned and off milk as, as quickly as possible. Right, so moving on to some of the um, health protocols. Um, so I suppose the first thing I mentioned earlier was uh, BVD. Uh, so everything coming in needs to be either BBD tested or from a BBD farm. We've then got to be looking at uh, the pneumonia issues um, on the farms. Um, this can be quite a big issue if you're buying off several different farms and there's a mix of diseases there. 
Um, quite often you'll find that if you're buying off, uh, say, one autumn carver or one spring carver, you have a lot less issues because uh, there isn't a mix of viruses around there. But as a standard, um, we should be vaccinating against um, RSV um, and PI3. So those are the main uh, viruses. And then we've also got uh, your Pasteurella manchinia as well. So um, many of the, the vaccines actually cover for these. And uh, I suppose just to give you an example of um, a vaccine program for pneumonia, uh, you could go with a, an intranasal um, as soon as those calves get on the farm. That will generally cover for uh, RSV and PI3, and that will give you cover for, for three months. Um, the other way of doing it is you could actually give them um, an intramuscular injection, um, and you would give that on entry to the farm, and then about three to four weeks later. So the slight difference with that is, is that you need your two vaccines, and it would take about three weeks um, after the first, after the second vaccine to become completely immune to those viruses. Or well, with the intranasal, after 10 days, um, they're immune. So the, the immune response is a lot greater, if that makes sense. Um, after the two doses, um, the calves are then immune for six months, to give you an idea. Um, another problem is, is IBR. So again, uh, the calves should have a, a vaccine for this as they come in. And again, that could be a, an intranasal vaccine as well. So that's generally everything that can be covered in terms of pneumonia. Um, another big issue um, which can come in uh, to the calf rare in unit is microplasma. So there are uh, vaccines which have just been developed in the, the USA for microplasma, but quite often you'll find that um, it's always in the background um, of the calf rare in shed. And if you see a, a calf with a droopy ear or a, sometimes a swollen joint, um, it could be microplasma. And quite often it'll flare up if there's a stress event uh, like a, a quick weaning or, or even in the case of disbudding or something like that. So it's something to be uh, very wary of. Uh, Coxy can be an issue. Um, again, probably more in the grass-based spring-born systems. Um, but again, that can be treated by dosing or putting it in the feed. Generally, uh, it shouldn't be an issue unless there's an issue on, on farm. If you keep um, plenty of straw and, and keep uh, the calves well bedded, they should be all right. And then um, the other main vaccine is the clostridial. So again, particularly if you're aiming to get those calves out to grass, I'd always try and do the two clostridial tanging one vaccines before they go out. Um, and then you'd be just topping them up every, every six months as you go. Again, with the pneumonia, um, as those cattle get bigger, um, it's up to you whether you, you look to do, do them again every six months. Um, again, some farms uh, do them if they bring them in to, to house, while others uh, will leave them and, and can get away with it. But again, it's, it's something you need to consider and, and talk to with your Right, so looking at the, the weaning of calves. So uh, the three uh, photos there just give you an idea of uh, the rumen and what we're aiming to develop. So in the picture A, you can see that the calves just had milk only. And again, uh, it hasn't really developed that rumen at all. In B, uh, you can see milk and hay, and you can see a slight fold in there, um, the rumen, but not much. And then finally, uh, with picture C, we've got milk and a gra grain-based starter feed. I can really see how that grain has developed that rumen a lot quicker. So again, what we're aiming for them is to eat some meal um, and grain to really develop that rumen as quickly as possible. So sometimes that's where the reduction in the, the milk helps to develop that rumen a little bit further. So by utilizing straw and having straw available, and then the calves always eating uh, the grain or the concentrate pellet, uh, what we're aiming for is to, for them to actually be eating about a kilo and a half a day each um before you actually wean them and when we're weaning we're aiming for a weight of about 75 to, to 85 kilos and generally a gradual weaning uh, works a lot better than abrupt weaning and um, by that we aim to you know reduce the milk slowly over a 10 
days to a fortnight period. And then that's shown to increase growth rates by about 0.2 of a kilo over that period of time. And again, um, if a certain calf uh, doesn't just properly, uh, stick it back on milk and then look to gradually wean it again. So every calf is slightly different. Some could be 85 kilos and not um, may not have actually eaten any meal at all. So it's just uh, something that has to be taken into account. Right, so just looking at um, some of the rearing costs. Uh, so just looking at this chart, to start with, I've just assumed the current uh, price for seeing Angus steer. Um, as you may know, the, the calf price is very dear at the moment. The beef price has dropped, uh, jumped up. And then also this time of the year, there's a shortage of calves on the ground as well. Um, so this was just looking at uh, one type of system, which was um, using slightly less milk powder than conventional. Um, but generally, you'll find that um, no matter what the system is, we're looking at about £150 to, to rear that calf before the purchase of it. So in this instance, we're looking at about £20 of milk powder, about 80 of concentrates, straw at £80 a tonne is about £15. And vet and med, uh, you're talking probably £20 worth of vaccines and then maybe a fiver um, with some antibiotic use and uh, the use of anti-inflammatories, which is very important to, to bring that antibiotic use down. I've got TB tests there if you were looking to ship them on to, to sell. Uh, mortality at 2.5% is about £5. And then again, you've got sundries, so that could be a little bit of dehorning or spare tags, uh, gas canisters, uh, or anything really. So generally when we're, we're looking to add the calf back into that, we're looking at about £370. And then if you're actually going out to, to purchase these calves as weanlings, you're really going to add on roughly 45 to £50 rearing fee for somebody who's reared that calf for you. So if you're buying weanlings, you'd be looking at around £420 for an Angus steer at the moment, just to give you a very rough, rough figure. Um, so you could argue um, you'd rather keep that £50 yourself and do the calf rearing or if you're doing it on a larger scale and you need to get uh, somebody in to help with labour, um, you might be better off just buying the, the calves as we use. Right, so after we've done the, the calf rearing bit, uh, the next important stage is actually the transition to grass. Um, so particularly with, say, autumn-born calves, um, they've gone through through the winter on ad lib concentrates after they've been weaned and then generally what I would uh, try and get farmers to do is reduce uh, the concentrates down to about a kilo ahead before they, they go out to grass and then over a probably a three week period um, you'd feed uh, concentrates and you'd probably actually put out a little bit of silage just to get them to adjust to the, the grass over that period. So generally during the transition of three weeks to a month, you'll find that um, the growth rates of those cattle will actually drop off. So you could be down to half a kilo rather than the 0 0.8, 0 0.9 you'd be looking for. But after that period, if they've um, adapted to the transition well, um, hopefully you're, you're back up to that 0 0.8, 0 0.9 of a kilo. So it's very important to, to look at that adjustment over that period of time. So whether that's feeding in troughs or through a sheep snacker. And again, sometimes silage or straw is going to help, especially with that very lush grass in the spring, which will tend to go straight through them. Um, it's probably a little bit easier with the spring-born calves um, because you can move them to grass while they're on milk and concentrates. So generally you're, you're weaning them while they're, they're at grass, so they're already adjusted uh, to the grass. And then you're aiming to try and maintain a kilo, kilo and a half of, of feed or concentrates until they get to about 100 kilos. And then after that period, you're really looking for them to, to move um, at grass alone, um, just to try and reduce your costs. So of course, for those spring-born calves, you've got much straw costs um, and hopefully reduction in concentrates as well. So looking at the, the first season of grass, uh, what we're aiming to do is really trying to achieve a target of about 0.7 to 0.8 of a kilo. 
and that's going to be very similar for the autumn born or the spring born calves. So the spring born calves will have, you know, milk and concentrates at the start, um, and then they'll probably be slightly below this target um, initially when they're, they're on grass alone. Um, I think it's very important to be using rotationally graze, grazing during this, this period just to try and maintain quality. Um, and really what we've got to be doing is trying to put them into lower covers or, or sheep covers really, which would be at about two and a half thousand kilos of dry matter per hectare. So really we're looking at a, a can coke, uh, sorry, a can of coke, um, you know, just upright really. So it's that kind of height we're aiming to, to go into really for these cattle. And hopefully that's going to be, you know, nearly 12 ME grass and, you know, 18, 20% protein in that grass so hopefully they'll they'll go and move on quite quite well it's also important not to push those calves too hard to graze that sward down initially so normally we'd say graze down to golf ball height um, but for those calves for those first two or three months of grass uh, we just aim to, to move them on once they've eaten probably 50 60 percent of that grass so the utilization actually is a lot lower and then for that reason, uh, a leader follower system may be needed to maintain that grass quality. So you could come in with suckler cows, sheep, or your second age group, your finishing cattle to try and clean up that sward. So those are all ways you could go about maintaining that grass quality. Fecal egg counting is very important during that first season. Um, the biggest issue for lack of growth tends to be worm worm issues or high egg counts during that first season so you may need to worm two if not three times uh, during that first season um, and then just gently increase the entry covers um, as cattle age so it's going from that coke can to beer can height slowly as you, you're going up through that season as the cattle get stronger and are, are able to graze properly right so we've done the grazing season uh, then we're then looking into the, the winter feeding stage. So again, on a, a grass-based system, what we're aiming to do is be very reliant on very high quality silage. So the slight disadvantage of a dairy beef system and like a suckler cow system is that you need quality grass and quality silage all year round. So sometimes that doesn't always happen, but you want to try and maintain it as, as high as possible. Now, if you're able to do that, it really reduces uh, the amount of concentrates you need uh, through that winter period. So really what we're aiming for is a target of about 0.7 kilo of daily live weight gain. Um, this can be done on excellent quality silage. And again, we probably only need to give half a kilo to a kilo of concentrates if the silage is of very good quality. Now, the main reason why we're we're aiming for a lower target on a grass-based system is that we'll actually get compensatory growth through the following grazing season. So we don't want to push them too high. And research uh, from Chagas in Ireland, uh, which is where the, the table's been taken from, have actually shown that the cattle actually catch up um, the concentrate fed cattle, which would be aiming for a kilo a day for that winter period. So there's no point pushing them any higher than we have to. So if we're aiming for a D value of 70 in our silage, uh, that's the equivalent of 74 DMD in Ireland. Um, so really 70 D value silage, according, according to that graph, will give us a live weight gain of about 0.8 in a kilo. So really that's what we're, we're aiming to look at. And then we may get away with um, no concentrate use at all. Um, and if we are supplementing, uh, it's likely that the, we're only gonna need something like raw barley and some minerals uh, because we've probably got a very high protein level in the in the silage as well. Um, Outwintering is the other option to try and reduce our costs. Um, again, we're aiming for that target of about 0.7 of a kilo. Um, the big thing with outwintering is that we do get exceptional compensatory growth during the spring. So they'll come off the crops of kale or fodder beet and they could be doing, you know, 1.2, 1.3 kilos for the first six weeks. So they won't have a check at all. So they really move on. And then the other important thing is um, it's about 50% cheaper than, than housing. So it's something to certainly look at if you've got the right type of farm because it can really reduce your cost. But again, um, 
you know, after last winter, it was very tricky on several farms. And you must be in a, a lower rainfall area um, with, you know, very free drain soils to be able to achieve it. So finishing at grass, um, so we've gone through that winter, really we're aiming for a target of about 1.3 kilos a day, plus of grass. Again, we wanted to rotational, rotationally graze. Um, the picture in front of you there shows cattle coming out uh, in early March, and you can see um, you know, how hard they've, they've hit that pasture and paddock, and now they're in the second half of it for some good quality grazing. So you can see the cattle, they're, they're not hugely shiny at this stage, uh, not carrying a huge amount of cover, but we've grown the frame. And really now the priority is to put on that, uh, put on that fat and really get them finished as quick as possible. So we're aiming for uh, very high quality. Um, we're aiming for covers which are slightly higher. So 2,800 to 3,100 entries, so that's your beer can height going in. Again, we're grazing down to golf ball height uh, to try and maintain that, that quality. And really the rotational grazing there is just to boost grass growth and really our stocking rate. Um, it just allows us to utilize more grass than it would with set stocking. Um, really we're wanting that good quality swords throughout. We want to maintain grass quality throughout the season. However, um, it's always a, a playoff between uh, maintaining grass quality and, and growing those those cattle at a, a certain uh, performance. So we may actually, to get them to be doing 1.3 to 1.5 kilos, we may actually put them into a field for them to actually graze maybe half of the field um, and then push them on and then we could have some slightly smaller cattle come in to, to mop it up, say the ones which are 50 kilos behind it, the, the ones most ahead. So that's one way we could we could uh, utilize it to really push and add some finish to the, those cattle. Again, if feed's required in the autumn, if we've got good grass supply there and it's just a little bit wet, we could add about three kilos a day of a mostly barley kind of base concentrate. We don't really need the high protein. And if there's no or if there's little or poor grass quality there, we'd be aiming for up to six kilos. Uh, to really push them at grass. So again, if it's gone summer dry, uh, like it has near us, we may need to push them out a little bit harder to, to get them to fetch up. Finishing at housing, so we're aiming really to target again over 1.3 kilos of daily live weight gain. We're aiming for the ration to be over 12 ME, generally over 20% starch, uh, and to have a crude protein of 12 to 14%. Um, so really for your spring-born calves, we'd be aiming to finish those inside and try and get some away by Christmas. Um, we could do it with ad-lib silage and about seven kilos of, say, barley. Um, or we could actually push them to ad-lib, aiming for 11 to 12 kilos of dry matter of feed and uh, one and a half kilos of straw. So then we'd be pushing growth rates uh, to 1.5 kilos plus um, for that system. So again, it all depends on what you're looking to do. So targets and returns, just to wrap up quickly, because I think I've been about 35 minutes. Um, so lifetime growth rates, we're aiming for about three quarters of a kilo uh, upwards. Uh, live weight of slaughter uh, can be anything from 570 to 700 kilos depending if you're at that 20 months or 30 months bracket. Uh, we're also aiming for carcass weights, a minimum of 260 kilos up to 370. And then carcasses, generally the supermarkets are happy with O plus three and four L in terms of fat. So that's what we're looking for. And then in terms of returns, um, what I thought I'd do is just put up some data from Chuggis in Ireland. So they've got 10 um, demonstration farms where they've been working uh, for three years. And it just gives you an idea of uh, what's possible here. So um, a stocking rate of 2.5 livestock units a hectare. So it's very highly stocked compared to the average in Wales, which would be about 1.1. Um, output is about 1,300 kilos um, a hectare, which is very high. Gross output. Um, you know, over £2,000. So this is leaving us a net margin at the bottom there of about €475 Euros per hectare. 
So this is before subsidies. So again, um, if you can maintain those fixed costs at the lower level, concentrate on um, your grass, your ability to grow grass and manage it properly, you can actually produce very good margins. But like I said, you need to be very hot on several of the subjects. Um, really, it's important to have a plan from the start to work out what you're aiming to do. You're aiming really to target that very high beef output per hectare. Uh, you'll need excellent calf rearing ability. So, um, you know, if your mortality rate's high, you're going to really reduce your, your overall margins. Um, it's very important to have a good animal health plan. And then in terms of grassland management, that has to be excellent. We also need to correct those soil fertility issues. So a lot of farms in Wales have low pHs and poor P and K. So it's important to get that side of it right. High quality silage, again, is a must for the system. And then really it's important to, to weigh the cattle and monitor to, to really see where you are. So just to summarize really, um, it is a system which can make you higher returns, but some of the some of the technical aspects have to be uh, to a higher level than you'd expect from a, a suckler herd alone. Uh, so I'm just going to stop there and um, hopefully we'll have a few questions. Okay, thank you. Lovely. Uh, iawn i Mark Jones am gyflwyniad hynod ddiddorol a gwybodus. Thank you ever so much, Mark, for a very um, interesting and informative um, presentation. There have been a few questions uh, coming through. Um, so the first one is, are there any particular breeds um, that tend to perform um, to hit that spec within uh, this type of system? Um, yeah, they'll, they'll all hit the specs really. So um, again, the, the native cattle will probably get to the minimum size of about um, five centi live weight, and you can probably push them up to about six fifty, and that they'll be in spec. Uh, some of the continentals you can then push to the, the higher end, but generally your, your native cattle will be O pluses. Uh, some of your black and whites will be O minuses, and then I suppose your Belgian blues would be, be looking at R grades, really. So they can all fit into the system. Um, again, the, the premium for the, the Angus at the moment and some of the Herefords can make uh, quite a difference. And sometimes stocking rate per hectare is better than pushing overall weights up. Okay, um, the next question then, uh, would you make straw, grain and concentrate etc available from the start and throughout the calf rearing stage or is it best to introduce it perhaps later on in the calf rearing stage? Yeah, I'd look to get it in front of the calves as soon as possible really. Uh, they're not going to eat much at all to start with so it's just putting a couple of handfuls out there so they don't waste it. Um, but the sooner they get onto it, and again, probably a blend would, um, yeah, work work better sometimes. Uh, okay, and then um, we've had a question saying um, that someone has started this system last year. Um, they've started farming last year. Natives coming up to finishing weights. Where would you um, start finding um, them an outlet? Um, yeah, uh, you're probably needing to start at least three months really before. Um, I know some of the Tesco contracts uh, got a requirement of three months prior. And then, um, you know, booking in times at the moment because there's a shortage of cattle, you can probably get them in within a fortnight or, or shorter. But again, when you're getting into the peak season um, in October, November time, you know, it could be a month uh, lead in times you can book them in. So it's important to. Yeah, phone round and and um, try and get rough numbers as early as you can. Okay, lovely. Um, next one. Most autumn calves bought as weedlings are fed on ad lib feed when they come from the rearing unit. When would you recommend introducing silage or hay ad lib ad lib to a diet when you are trying to reduce concentrates? And what rate concentrates would you recommend? Yeah, it, it all depends on the quality of the silage, but um, 
generally what I aim to do is um, keep them on the same diet as they were on the farm before, um, probably for a week just to settle in. And then after that point, I then introduce silage um, and keep the feed levels exactly the same. Then over the next uh, probably two, two weeks to three weeks, I just gradually reduce the, the concentrates in front of them down to about a kilo and a half. And then, um, yeah, just keep them at that rate. And again, it's important to weigh them just to see if they're, they're ticking on how you want, if that makes sense. Yeah, lovely, thank you. Um, another question, is arable silage suitable for winter finishing cattle? Um, it can be, um, it's got a higher starch uh, level, but it's not really got the, the energy levels you, you'd want. So you'd still have to supplement it probably with a, with a blend just to get the high enough energy to, to really put on uh, that extra weight that you want. So that kilo and a half. So have a word with a nutritionist and, and get a ration sorted. Okay. Um, someone would like to know, how did you come to the figure of £20 per head for the powder, for the milk powder? Yeah, I think um, that was about 14 kilos at uh, £1,600 a tonne. So that would have been, um, as a system we use at home, which, um, uh, yeah, we use a more expensive feed and take them off, um, we wean them early and take them off. Uh, sort of a restricted milk system is what we use so uh, most farms would probably use 20 to 25 kilos okay um is running steers and heifers together a disadvantage um no it's it's not um we'll run um a mob of 350 cattle uh, 50 50 heifers and steers uh, the only one thing I would say is when you're coming up to finishing, sometimes the steers, um, especially out of Holstein, you get the odd one which just grows and grows and doesn't put any uh, flesh on. So you may need to separate them for that last 50 or 60 days if you don't think they're, they're putting the, the flesh on. Lovely. Um, and what is the minimum age post weaning that you could turn out that? Um, it's all dependent on uh, the weather conditions. If um, it's nice and mild um, and warm, um, like the spring spring block uh, grazing guys, dairy guys, you know, they'll be if the weather's good, they'll they'll chuck them out. Um, sort of three weeks of age, four weeks of age. Lovely. Um... Another question, dairy men would and are feeding higher rates of concentrates throughout the life of a calf. Should the beef sector be looking to do the same? Um, it could be. Um, I suppose I've just picked on this on systems because we're in Wales um, and we've got a lot of grass. So again, if you're on the borders and you've got, um, you're able to get big Arctic lorries and supplements in nice and cheap, it can fit in. However, really with dairy beef you need them at least out for a season of grass and if you manage it properly um, it's more cost effective but you can have you can have your other systems where you can be aiming for 16 to 18 months uh, on ad lib and that, that may suit your farm uh, but again you know you want to be getting artic loads in of, of meal uh, you may have your own your own cereals and straws so it's a, a different kettle of fish there okay thank you um, over the second winter, would you advise cubicle housing or loose housed um, deep straw bed? Yeah. Um, it doesn't really matter, to be honest, as long as they're, they're comfortable and they've got enough feed space. Um, I suppose the only thing to think about is uh, clipping and how dirty the cattle get. So again, you'd get charged £15 um, a head or you'd have to clip yourself. But there may need to be a bit of clipping if they're on straw bedding anyway. So um, again, it just depends how clean they are in the cubicles. Um, and again, with steers and, and heifers, it's where they pee is different. So it just all depends on the on, on what you're doing. Uh, okay. Um, is it at weaning you change from straw to silage hay and concentrates? I would try and um, 
push them on really until they get to, well, I suppose for the, the more indoor system or the autumn calves, I keep pushing them until they got to about 120 kilos. Um, I probably introduce a bit of silage earlier than that, just for them to nibble at. Uh, but I wouldn't really want to reduce maybe the concentrate level until I got to that 120 kilos. And then we'd be aiming for 180, 200 kilos uh, turnout weight for those um, October born calves. Okay. Um, so just another quick question. If you're on a strict rotational grazing, um, how would you recover um, from severe poaching? Say it's been wet and you, you, you're on strict um, rotational grazing. How do you recover from something like that? Yeah, uh, it's important if it's uh, a very wet period to either keep moving them onto the next paddock and the next one, uh, just to reduce the damage. What you don't want to do is come back to that paddock and poach it here. Uh, normally it'll recover on its own um, if it's just been poached the once. Um, otherwise, you know, bring them off, uh, put them on a track for a few hours if it's extreme rain, um, or even on the edges of the year, um, maybe a matter of rehousing and then sticking them back out again. So it's important to be flexible with the rotational grazing. And again, uh, the use of tracks, um, if you're looking to develop the system further, will, will help a lot in the, in the long run. Okay, and just um, a final question, I think, uh, with regards to bedding, is there a preferred bedding? Is it barley straw, wheat straw, um, sawdust? What, what do you find best? Uh, barley straw tends to be better than wheat, just because it's uh, a lot more fluffy and uh, they seem to be able to disappear in the straw as, as young calves, so if you're very deep fitted, um, it helps. Uh, wheat straw uh, tends to flatten out uh, quite quickly um, and then maybe the use of calf jackets will, will help. Um, again sawdust, there's plenty of farms uh, which are happy with that but it's trying to get uh, the sawdust without too much dust uh, and not the, the real fine stuff really so there's different ways of doing it so that'll suck the moisture out and quite often farmers will put straw on the top of that as well so um, that works quite well. Okay, and we've just had a, another question through. Uh, what would be your best tips in terms of sourcing carbs? Yeah, so I suppose you could either go and uh, find a dairy farmer directly um, and then aim to see the, see the calves, see the system. Um, and then you've got an idea of vaccines and the health and quality of the calves. So that'd be the, the best option. Um, I suppose secondly, you know, you could use um, a collection centre. Uh, so there's uh, firms like the Meadow Quality, Butlas, Let Livestock. So they'll source from several different farms. So there is a little bit more mixing of disease. But again, they're working with farms which, um, you know, have a higher health status and they wouldn't be taking farms, reg uh, calves off farms, which would, uh, well, which produce poor calves, if that makes sense. So those are probably your, your best bets. And then again, markets, you can get them good calves from markets, but again, um, you've normally got no idea of the background uh, or where they've come from. And again, there's a big mix of diseases in, in a collection center like that in terms of the market. Okay, lovely. Um, no more questions. Um, allai jyst diolch yn fawr uh, i chi gyd am y minod ar gwemyn ar heno uh, a diolch unwaith eto i uh, Mark Jones am i gyflwyniad. Uh, thank you all for attending this uh, webinar tonight. I hope you've enjoyed and thank you once again to Mark Jones for a very informative presentation and I hope you've all enjoyed it.